Good morning and welcome to Scottsdale Baptist Church. My name is Jeff and I'm one of the pastors here. If you're joining with us online, we want to welcome you today as well. And if you are joining us in the Cross Point Center, we are so delighted that you continue to gather with us on a weekly basis to worship together. How many of you guys can believe that tomorrow is the first day of March? Well, it seems like this year has flown by, doesn't it? I mean, the things that maybe you anticipated doing and starting this year, all the, the, uh, the things that you had planned as it related to your life, the, the things for goals and all those things, maybe, maybe you fell victim to the quit day on January the 17th, which is actually a day I found it, that that's when most people give up on their resolutions. And you maybe have found yourself now in this rhythm of life that isn't what you hoped it was going to be. It wasn't what you wanted it to be whenever you began the year. Maybe you've made some trade-offs along the way, some things that you didn't anticipate doing, but now they're part of the daily rhythm of your life. Maybe for some of you, you traded in gym time for sleep time. You hit the snooze button a couple more times than you would have otherwise, and and that anticipation and desire to get back in the gym has just kind of fallen off into Never Never Land. You're sleeping it away. Maybe some of you had a plan to be part of a, a keto diet and yet you've traded it off for the comfort foods that you enjoy so much. Oh, the, the fast food line and the, and the cookies and all those things that make you feel better. And, and maybe because of those first two trade-offs, instead of wearing your suit pants to work, you've been wearing your sweatpants to work. They're a little bit stretchier. They're they're not quite as form fitting. And, and, and then you realize the weather's getting warmer. Spring breaks right around the corner. It's beach season. And you feel like you are in a fix. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now that, that you have all these things that you're wondering about and, and beach season's right around the corner and you think, oh, how in the world am I going to get back to where I need to be. Now, as much as we like personal comfort, we recognize that sometimes those things can move over into the Christian life. We can make some trade-offs along the way and, and the things that we hope to see happen are not the things that we see. And as we've seen from the beginning of our study in the book of Acts, God's desire for the church is never for it to be comfortable. It's never for it to be content with gathering large crowds and, and just being together. God's desire, and we've seen this in the book of Acts, is for the gospel to start in Jerusalem and for it to move all the way out to the ends of the earth, where people from every nation and language and tribe and tongue come to bow before King Jesus. We've seen with Stephen, the first martyr, how God begins to move the church out of Jerusalem. And today we're going to spend our time together in Acts 8 through 12. And I want us to read just in the beginning here from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, as we begin our time together. This is what we read. And Saul approved of his, Stephen's, execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, as we read this, we must understand, first of all, that God didn't move the church out and didn't, didn't allow persecution to happen because the church was necessarily doing anything wrong. In reality, the persecution was because of their faithfulness, because they were being faithful in sharing the gospel. We also noted just in the beginning of our passage here that the only people that stayed in Jerusalem were the apostles. I think this helps us to understand just as we start thinking about this, that the, the movement of the gospel to the ends of the earth was accomplished and carried out by people whose names we may never, ever, ever know. Names of people who were faithful to the call that God put on their lives. 
people who embraced the call to move out of their comfort zones. You see, they could have, they could have recanted. They could have thrown in the towel. They could have said, this is too much for us. We just want to go back to our safe havens. We want to go back to our safety nets, to our comfort zones and not be in so much danger. But they recognized that something better awaited them. There was something that was far greater than the comfort that they could have experienced and that was the commitment to the call of Jesus Christ. The same is true for us today. The same is true for us today as it was for that very first church. We can move back and fall back into our safe havens or we can join God in seeing the gospel move forward. And so today, for the remainder of our time, I want to challenge us I want to challenge us to trade in comfort zone Christianity. I want us to trade in comfort zone Christianity for the call that God has put on us as his church. Would you pray with me as we begin our time together? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that today we have the opportunity to study it, to read it, and for your spirit to take this word and apply it in our lives. I pray that you would strengthen us to hear. I pray that you would Strengthen our resolve to follow you, whatever the cost. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As I've spent time working through this passage, I believe that there are four trade-offs that God calls us to through this passage of scripture. The first thing that I believe God calls us to is this. He calls us to trade in the comfort of convenience for the commitment to our call. To trade in the comfort of convenience for the commitment to our call call. This is the testimony of the the next person that we meet in Acts. His name is Philip. And I want to take a few snapshots of Philip's life so we can see how he continued faithfully rather than uh, falling to the comfort of convenience. The first thing that we see in terms of his life starts in verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. Now, as the disciples were scattered, People went about preaching. One particular disciple named Philip went down to Samaria. It's about a 40 mile hike from Jerusalem. So he walks to to Samaria and he begins to share the gospel with those people who are there. Uh, We know that Philip is one of the disciples who was responsible in that very first church for serving tables. He's what we call a deacon in the life of this church. And he was serving the tables. uh, You remember from the uh, situation in Acts chapter six. The only thing that we know about him is that he was a man that was uh, full of the spirit of good repute and he was uh, known and respected by the church members. This is the qualifications that Peter gave as it relates to this position. Aside from that, we don't really know a whole lot about him. We don't have any evidence that he was a very, uh, very great speaker, that he had a great uh, ability to, to preach or to teach or to talk. We see that he was faithful. We see that he did what God called him to do. He took his trip to preach the gospel to a people that were historically not well thought of by Israelites, the Samaritans. He went and he shared the gospel with them. He taught them about who Jesus was and what Jesus had done on their behalf. And through his teaching and preaching ministry, many people became believers. Now it would have been easy for Philip to start the first Sumerian church the first church of Samaria. And he could have stayed there and he could have lived his life preaching the gospel to them, encouraging them, helping them. Or he could have just gone back to Jerusalem. He could have gone back to Jerusalem and begun serving tables again. He could have continued in the ministry that he was already doing. But that's not what we see happen in Philip's life. We'll drop down a few verses to verse 26. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. God calls Philip to take a new trip. This time, he's to go south to Gaza. Now, in this, there are two roads that somebody could have taken to get there. One road was a a highly traveled road, and the other one is more of a desolate road, and we see that Luke describes it as the desert place. It would be kind of like this for us. If somebody said to you, I want you to take a trip to Raleigh, and instead of going down I-40 to get to Raleigh, I want you to use Highway 421. 
I want you to go up to Sanford and then I want you to make a a right-hand turn on Highway 1 and then I want you to get into Raleigh that way. Now for us, some of you guys are like, huh, didn't even know there's another way to get to Raleigh. I thought 40 was it. No, there's a different way, uh, but it is a less convenient way. It's a little bit more laborious. There's more stops. It's slower traffic. The same is true in this way. Philip is called to, to go down this dusty road and we see his continued commitment. Verse 27, and he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. I love this guy. Philip is like, he's like overachiever of the year, isn't he? God says, go, and Philip runs. Now, parents, how would you love it if you coach your kids to do something and they went with this kind of zeal to do what you asked them to do? Philip is just, he is excited about the opportunity to share the gospel. And subsequently, Philip spends time with him. He helps him understand what Isaiah is saying about the suffering servant and about the role of Jesus in redemption. This man comes to faith in Christ while he's with him there in the chariot. The man sees a body of water and he says, why can't I get baptized? And so Philip goes and baptizes this man immediately to show his identification with Jesus. See in verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Now maybe God carried him away to a comfortable place. Maybe he carried him back to Jerusalem so that he could live out his life in his retirement time. He's been faithful, hasn't he? He shared the gospel with people and they've come to faith in Christ. Maybe it's time for Philip to relax and just look at the fruits of his labor, all the things that God has done in his life. That's not what we see. We see God carry him away. And then in verse 40, but Philip found himself in Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. You see, Philip wasn't content with living the life in the comfort of convenience, waiting for people to come to him, maybe even passing the people off to a more qualified individual to share the gospel with them. He knew that the call to follow Christ was a commitment to share the gospel with his words to people who had not heard of him. Now, it would have been easier for him to say, Mr. Ethiopian, if you'll just come with me to the first Jerusalem church, there's a guy there. His name is Peter. And Peter is a phenomenal preacher. He can tell you all the things that you need to know about Jesus. But he didn't do that. He didn't say, come and and hear what Peter's going to say. No, he took the time personally to share the gospel with these people. We see that if the gospel is going to advance in our world, we as his people will have to trade in what I call the field of dreams mentality. The field of dreams mentality is this, if we build it, they will come. If we build it, they'll come in and they'll hear. But what we see from this picture is God saying to Philip and to us, he says, I will build it. Now it's time for you to get going. It's time for you to get going into your world to share the gospel with those who have not heard. For us as adults, maybe in your mind, you think if I can just invite them to the church building, if I can just invite them to the church building, then then Pastor Phil will preach. And when Pastor Phil will preach, then then certainly they'll hear the gospel and they'll believe. For those of you that that are students, that are part of our student ministry, you think, man, if I could just get my, my classmates to come with me to youth group on Wednesday night, then Pastor Tucker will, will preach and, and God can do a great work in their lives. But we've, we see in this passage, friends, that just like Philip, we are called because God has placed us into those people's lives. We are called to get into the chariot with them. We're called to get into their chariots. Whatever life situations and circumstances they are in, God has called you to be the one that shares with them the truth of the gospel. 
God has called you to enter into those life situations and circumstances. God has called you to bear witness to the truth of who Jesus is in their lives. As we think about the church, the day is is gone when people who aren't believers are gonna come to our church, no matter how exciting and trendy our music is, no matter how well qualified our pastors are, no matter how cool the programs are that we have, we must take the commitment seriously to take the gospel to those who have not heard, to engage our neighbors with the message of life-giving hope that comes through Jesus Christ. I know like many of you, I long to see God do that work. I long to see God radically transform our neighborhoods. And for us, it begins with stepping out and trading off the comfort of convenience with the commitment to the call to the gospel. The second trade we see in the book of Acts is that we are called to trade the comfort of self-confidence for the freedom of gospel confidence. Trade the comfort of self-confidence for the freedom of gospel confidence. Now, as Philip is moved to his new mission field, we begin to see God work in the life of a man named Saul. We pick up with Saul in Acts chapter nine. It says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was convinced that he was on God's side in this. He was convinced that he was in the right and that he was actually doing something great for God. Remember that Saul is a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, we remember that just a few months earlier, the Pharisees are the ones that called Jesus a blasphemer, that had him crucified because of what they considered blasphemy. So Saul is really just continuing that pharisaical tradition, going and seeking to find all those who are committed to Christ, who he would consider blasphemers, and trying to root out this religion from the earth. For Saul, this would have added to an already impressive religious resume, one that in his life produced a self-confidence or a self-righteousness before the Lord, one that depended not on God's work, but on his work, on his abilities, on his power. Notice how Saul, who would later become the apostle Paul, writes about this in Philippians chapter three. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, it's easy for us to be zealous about something. It's easy for us to be sincere about something, as Paul was, and at the same time, to be sincerely wrong, to be sincerely misguided. And for us as the church, this can become a hindrance as it did to Paul or to Saul. Because as we live in a life of self-confidence, we begin to judge others based on our understanding of righteousness. We we, instead of reaching out, we begin to look down on others. We begin to judge their, their righteousness based on our abilities. We build a resume of good works to show that we are really okay, that we're better than our neighbors, at least. And so in our eyes, we think that we have made some progress with God. But God in his grace in our lives and in Saul's life, will not allow us to continue going on in that way. And we see how God continues to work through to Saul. It says, now as he was on his way to Damascus, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. See, God radically 
confronts Saul with his own self-righteousness. He confronts Saul on the road to Damascus. He completely upends Saul's plans and sets him on a completely different path of life so that the testimony of the future apostle Paul in Philippians 3 would be this. Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. What the apostle Paul came to find was that freedom, true fear to freedom, is not found in relying on our own abilities. It's not found in relying on our own works. It's not relying on who we can be for God. But it's relying on God's work in us. True freedom is found in relying on somebody else's resume, relying on somebody else's resume of perfect obedience, Jesus's resume of perfect obedience obedience in our place. It gives us humility where there was pride. It gives us fearlessness where there was once fear of, did I do enough stuff? Have I done enough good things for God to be happy with me? Have I done enough good things for God to be pleased with me? See, this trade moves us from self-confidence to finding our confidence in what God has accomplished on our behalf. And this is where we find true freedom. Now I think about this as it relates to our kids. Just this past week, our son Silas, he's eight years old and we were at the dinner table and, and oftentimes we'll have uh, dinner table conversations and sometimes they're just silly conversations. Sometimes we're telling everybody to be quiet because it's just been a loud day. And, and this time though, Silas, in the, in the middle of our conversation, he just said, said this statement. I think it just rings true for so many people. He said, what happens if I get to heaven and God decides he doesn't like me? What if I get there and, and God just decides on a whim or, or for some reason that he doesn't like me? Now, I bet for some of us today, the, the question that rattles around in, a, in an eight-year-old brain, maybe the question that, that haunts you on a regular basis? Is there any way that I can be sure that I will be acceptable before God? Is there any way that I can have confidence that God will accept me? Maybe you try to answer that question by looking over your life and, and saying, I've done this, 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 and this. I'm, I've been a pretty good person. You know, I haven't done the things that the people on the news have done the people that are being charged with murder or other things like that, I haven't done those things. So surely if we're basing it on like a sliding scale and then I'm gonna be okay. And, and maybe that's good enough stuff for God to let me in. Maybe that's good enough for God's acceptance. But I can assure you from scripture that that won't get you there. Looking across your life and saying, maybe I've done enough good stuff isn't going to accomplish the confidence that God desires for us to walk with. You see, the only answer, and there is 100% surety in this, the only answer, the only way that we can be accepted before a holy God is to first understand and admit that we're sinners. Admit that we have offended a holy God and that there's nothing that we can do to earn his favor. There's no works that we can do. There's no number of times we can come to church. There's no number of times that we can read through the whole Bible that will make God happy with us. We must admit that we're a sinner. And then we must ask God to forgive us on the basis of Jesus's finished work on the cross, his perfect obedient life, his substitutionary death on our behalf and his resurrection from the dead on the third day to show that his, his death 
was sufficient for accomplishing our salvation. God's stamp of approval on him is your only hope, is our only hope. And then surrendering our life to Jesus as king, surrendering to him as the Lord of our lives. Friends, this brings the kind of freedom that we see in the apostle Paul's life. He goes from a man who persecuted the church to a man who lives fearlessly for the mission of the gospel, to share it with those who indeed hate him because of the message. That is what frees us. That is what frees us to live in a gospel confidence, not fearful about am I doing enough good stuff, but fear, fearless in living out what God has saved us for. Friends, we don't have to be fearful of what lies ahead if we are confident in the work of Christ. This leads us to the third trade that God calls us to. First, the, third, the trade, trade in the comfort of control for the danger of dependence. We are called to trade in the comfort of control for the danger of dependence. As I read through this, I thought to myself, and maybe for us, this might be the most difficult one. This might be the most difficult one because uh, we love to be in control of the things that are going on in our lives. We like to know where everything is and everything has its place. And if it's not there, we get a little bit of, a little bit of anxiety there. But we see as Saul is blinded by the Lord, God begins to work in the heart of another individual, calling him out of his comfort zone as well. We see this in the life of a man named Ananias in verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, here I am, Lord. Now, if you recall, we just read that Damascus is where Saul was going, right? And we know why Saul was going there. He was going there with letters from the synagogues to arrest Christians. And if Ananias is part of that church, and it stands to reason that Ananias is probably one of the leaders in that church. So here God is calling Ananias, one of the leaders of the church. He's gonna call him to do something that is quite dangerous. He's faithful, but his faith is about to be tested. His faith is about to be tested as God continues to call him in verse 11. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, for some of us, we might say things are about to get real for Ananias. He's about to get called to go do something that he could not imagine. And if you were Ananias, you might start thinking, hmm, I wonder if those are the lentils talking. The lentils from last night. Surely God wouldn't ask me to do this. Surely God wouldn't ask me to go do something that is like a suicide mission. Surely God knows what I've been doing here in this church. My ministry is now on the line. If I go here, my life is on the line. So Ananias asked God a question. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. God, do you, are you sure you know what you're doing? God, are you, are you sure? You know this is a Saul, right? The Saul that's coming to kill us. Are you sure that you really want me to do that? Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. He goes. One call from the Lord one question, and he goes. Whereas he could have held on to his comfort, where he could have held on to what he had already accomplished, he could have held on to his best life in Damascus. 
He said, not my will, Lord, yours. Your will be done. Your will be done in my life. I will go because you have called me. I will trust you, Lord, with my life. I will trust you with my plans. I will trust you with my future. And you may be thinking, okay, I've never heard from God in an audible voice. I've never seen a vision like this. And so it seems like most of these interactions, if not all of them happen in the first century church. So, so I'm okay. God's not gonna ask me to do this. He's not gonna ask me to do something this crazy. But friends, what we see in scripture, the reality is this. Whenever you surrendered your life to Jesus, whenever you called on him as your Lord and savior, you said, here I am Lord. You said, take me wherever you want me to go. Send me wherever you want me to go. I am yours. I am yours to the ends of the earth. I am yours if it means my life. I am yours. You see, biblical Christianity is a fundamental transfer of who leads our life. Before Christ, we are the ones that try to call the shots. After we have come to faith in him, he's the one that leads. We follow where he goes. And the longer I read scripture and the, the longer I'm a believer, I, I realize and I, I think I've come to see that Christianity really is very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. We complicate it, don't we? We complicate it because whenever we read things in scripture about what God tells us to do, we say, there's no way that God really wants me to do that. There's no way that God really wants me to do that. And we start to look for loopholes to get out of doing what God has called us to do. We start looking for ways to justify our disobedience with, with the statements like, God doesn't work like that anymore. God doesn't do those kinds of things anymore. And what we end up with is a Christianity that looks a lot like the American dream. A lot like uh, we're gonna build our lives and we're going to worship ourselves, we're gonna help ourselves rather than the culture shaking, gospel centered, community transforming movement that we see in the book of Acts. A movement that is built on wholehearted worship of our worthy, saving, sovereign King. And we live our lives as if we are the ones that are in control. We live our lives as if the one, we are the ones that get to call the shots rather than saying, submit all my plans to you, Lord. Submit all my desires to you. Take my life and use it for your glory. And this is a trade, a trade to embrace the danger of dependence because we see that in this embrace is the only place we truly find safety. We live life for ourselves and in our control, we are in danger. Whenever we live in the danger of dependence, we are actually truly safe. Find this a quote from Henry Martin to, to be a phenomenal reminder of this. He says, I am immortal until God's work for me to do is done. I am immortal until God's work for me to do is done because we will never live a day longer than God has intended and we'll never live a day less than God has intended for us to live. He knows exactly how many days. And so we, called, we are called to live in dangerous dependence upon him, relying on his sufficient grace for us in our lives. Now, as we embrace these first three trades, I believe God will do great work in our lives, but there's one. Now I love this because this is the reason that we're here today. This is the reason that we have gathered here, non-Jewish people, to worship Jesus. As we continue to work our way through Acts, the mission of God continues to spread just like Jesus said it would in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. To this point, we've seen Jewish people come to faith in Jesus Christ. We've seen Samaritans come to faith in Jesus Christ. And now, we'll see Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
And we see this as Peter ministers to a man named Cornelius. While we're not gonna spend a ton of time right now diving into this interaction, I would refer you, if, you have, if you've got a chance, uh, we have a reading plan for the book of Acts online, scottsill.org. So if you wanna catch up with, with all that God does through this interaction, I would encourage you to take time to read through that. Uh, you may have already read through it in your reading plan, so you'll know all these things as we go through. But this is related to a vision that Peter has about food when he's hungry. And we all have visions about food whenever we're hungry. Uh, that's why we don't usually go to the grocery store when we're hungry because we start taking everything off the shelves. But Peter has this vision regarding food at a time when he's hungry. In this vision, Peter is directed by God to begin eating some different kind of meats. And, and the meats that he is encouraged to eat or God directs him to eat uh, are meats that would have been considered unclean according to the Jewish dietary laws. So Peter would never ever in a hundred years willingly go out and look for these different kinds of food. We see Peter even in this refusing God for three times because these food restrictions were what separated in many ways the Israelites from all the other nations and, and set them up as a nation that was holy unto the Lord. But God is teaching Peter something. He's not just teaching him about food. He's really teaching him about people. He's teaching them about people that he is saving. And whereas people like the Gentile people were, were people that were off limits for even Jews to go and eat dinner with, now God is saying, I'm bringing them into the family. They're gonna be part of the people of God. And so what I have called clean, Peter, you can't call unclean anymore. It's now time for you to take a step and go minister to those who you historically would not have gone and minister to. God is showing Peter that the gospel door is out open to the nations. And as Peter shares the gospel with Cornelius, his whole family comes to faith in Christ. His whole family is baptized in the name of Jesus. Then as Peter goes back to Jerusalem, explains what happens, the church in Jerusalem is a little confused. They start to question Peter and say, ah, are you sure about this, Peter? Are you sure that the Gentiles are now part of God's people? And this is what Peter says to them. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God. This is the church in Jerusalem saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So rather than question and continue to ask more questions about the authenticity. They rejoice in God's work in saving people. God is saving Gentiles and he's doing what we all thought was impossible. Helps us see that God's limitless in his abilities. Now, I, I thought about this and was reminded that for us as people, it's easy for us to find our own flock and to get content and comfortable with the people that we like to be around. We have fun little sayings like, uh, the, the holy huddle, right? We're gonna get our holy huddle together and there's nobody else that's gonna be a part of that or, or us four and no more, which is kind of a trite saying to say, we kind of gather our group and once our group is gathered, then there's no more room for anybody else. It's comfortable to have conversations with those people, isn't it? The people that we agree with, the people that are just like us, the people that don't make us really think about why we're saying what we're saying or what we're doing. They all just kind of go along with the same things that we go along with. It's a whole nother thing to talk to somebody who is completely different in their worldview, who has a completely different set of values to be able to talk with them about the things of the Lord or even just things in their life. But imagine for a minute, just for a minute, if Peter said, God, they're just too different from me. They're just too different. God, we've been doing this for thousands of years. What's the point in changing now? We've, we've got a good system. I'll just go back and hang out with the Jerusalem church with all of our Jewish converts and we can talk about the Old Testament scriptures together. We can talk about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things. You know, the possibility is that none of us would have been here today. 
None of us could have possibly been here today. If Peter just said, okay, we're just gonna gather our, our group together and we're not gonna go out into the world. We're not gonna go out and talk to people that are different than us. The same call is true on our lives as it was on theirs. And we see over and over in these passages that from our perspective, we never know who God is working on at any given moment. We never know. We never know what God's doing in their hearts. And if maybe that next conversation that you have with them could be the opportunity that God is extending to them to save them from sin, to save them from death, save them from eternity and his judgment upon them. Let's embrace those opportunities. Let's take time to enter into their world and, and help them understand life from a biblical perspective. Ask them questions about what they believe. Help them understand how the gospel answers all the questions that they are asking in their life. Maybe for you, it is a neighbor. Maybe it's that neighbor that you're thinking of right now, like I could never have a conversation with that guy. I don't even know like what planet he's living on. Maybe it's what God's calling you to do. Maybe it's a coworker. Students, maybe it's, it's the kid that's kind of like the outcast or the, the one that nobody really hangs out with. You know the kid. Maybe it's that kid that God desires for you to go and begin having conversations with about the gospel in hopes that God will do a transforming work in their lives. And, and as we embrace this trade, it places us as participants in the picture of the beautiful redemptive diversity that God is accomplishing. Not like a theoretical accomplishing, but an actual accomplishing. We see this in Revelation chapter seven. John writes, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. The reality is that there will be, not might be, there will be people from every nation and language and tribe and tongue singing this song for all eternity. And we have the opportunity to be participants in seeing that accomplished. Though we don't save anybody, we are called to be the ambassadors and the witnesses for the king who does save people. And we have the opportunity today and tomorrow and for as many days as the Lord gives us to be witnesses to that life-changing, eternity-changing reality. I wanna encourage us to find our place in that story, to find our place as faithful members of his church. You see, God has far bigger plans than we could ever imagine. And when we settle for the comfort of cultural conformity, we miss out on the beauty of what God is accomplishing through his redemptive work in the gospel. Brothers and sisters, I'm convinced more and more as I read through the book of Acts, we see how God clearly moves in his church, that God is calling us out of comfort zone Christianity. He's calling us out of it, friends. He's calling us out of it and he's calling us into a movement of his work, a movement of life transformation, a movement where people are being radically transformed by the gospel. See, we've done things the same way for so long. We've done things the same way and we're expecting different results. We're expecting God to do something different with the, the things that we've been doing instead of saying, God, what is it that you want us to do? And then being faithful and obedient in those things. He's calling us to trade in our false comforts, our false hopes for things that truly provide comfort. He says, there's a greater comfort for you. There's a greater hope for you. One that is lasting and one that is true. And we see it even in this passage. In Acts chapter nine, verse 31, he says this. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. It multiplied. What we see is multiple examples of people who embrace the call 
the mission of the gospel. And what happened? God continued to multiply his church. God continued to expand his church. God continued to move what was once limited in a place called Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And here is the crazy thing. He is not done yet. He's not done yet. He is continuing to work in people's lives to bring them to faith in Jesus. And God is calling us today to trade in comfort zone Christianity for the comfort of the Holy Spirit in obedient Christianity. He's calling us to be faithful. He's calling us to a Christianity that relies daily on the strengthening of the Spirit as we're committed to make disciples in every nation. We're called to embrace the freedom of gospel confidence, no matter what the cost is, to see the gospel take root in the hearts and the lives of people from every nation and language and tongue for the glory of our great God. And here is the question for us today. Are you willing to make that trade? Are you willing to make that trade, to trade in the comfort zone Christianity for one that is committed, that is gospel confident, that is dependent upon the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, when it seeks the beauty of redemptive diversity in our culture, in our community. I pray that the Lord continues to derive and desi- that desire in my heart as I hope he does in yours as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. God, we know that being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to follow you faithfully, to leave the results to you, but to be faithful in obedience to your word. So God, today I pray that you would stir our hearts with such a desire for the renown of his name, We would submit our lives to you fully. In Christ's name we pray.